Hi, welcome back to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg, and uh, so grateful that you're watching my video today. If you are enjoying the content that I'm producing, please like and uh, the video on YouTube and subscribe to the channel, and um, I'll keep putting them out as long as people are watching them, and I appreciate you watching. If you have any uh, thoughts about the content, uh, please put a comment in the comment section. I'll, I'll answer all content, all, all questions, uh, comments, um, observations. Uh, if you want to contact me by email, it's wanderingwesleyan at hotmail.com. Uh, go ahead and shoot me an email if you'd like. But uh, we're continuing with our Stories of the Rabbi series, and uh, we're studying the Gospel of Mark. We haven't even made it out of the first chapter yet. I've turned the page in my Bible, but we haven't made it out of the first chapter. Hopefully we'll be doing that today. So, um, what we have here is a number of things have happened. So, we have the announcement that the Kingdom of God has arrived. We have the first four members of that Kingdom. James, John, Simon and Andrew. It's now time to see what that kingdom looks like. So here we have verses 21 through 28. They all went to Capernaum and right away, oh, there's Mark's favorite word, euthos, immediately, right away, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach. They were, they, meaning James, John, Andrew, Simon, and all the people there, and all the scribes and Pharisees that were there, they were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who had authority. This word authority, excusia, power, control. He was teaching in a way that was unlike anything they had ever heard before. He was teaching with authority and not like the scribes. Well, there's a poke in the eye to the scribes, right? It wasn't like the scribes. The scribes are pretty good. The scribes, so there were a number of, if you remember from my walk, Walking in the Word series, we talked about the different people that Jesus encountered, the different religious authorities that, that Jesus encountered. You had the Pharisees. So the Pharisees were ones who, uh, they, they believed in the resurrection. They believed in the letter of the law. They were very legalistic. They were very concerned that Israel as a nation would disappear if they didn't cling on to the law. These were remnants from the exile, people from the exile. So they remember what Israel went through, even though these particular people didn't go through the exile, but they're ancestors had and they had talked about how bad it was and how bad Israel was that it got exiled in the first place. So their concern was keep Israel adhered to the law. So that way, you know, there, there just won't be any question that Israel will exist. So they're very legalistic in nature. Then you have the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the Levites. Now they didn't believe in a resurrection. They really were very skeptical about anything that was supernatural. Uh, they were also the priests in the temple. So Zechariah, if you remember the story of John the Baptist from Luke, Zechariah was a Sadducee. How about that? So sad, you see, because they didn't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Um, they were kind of a corrupt group of people. Um, but so you have the Sadducees, you have the Pharisees, and then you have the scribes. The scribes were basically religious lawyers. These were these were fellows that would uh, write things down. They would write down. Uh, all of the they were they would copy manuscripts and they would copy laws and they would be the ones that would decide you know if if i need to bring my my mule from one house to another on the sabbath how many steps can i take before it's considered work you know that's the question that you bring to the scribes so when it says here that he had authority not like the scribes boy that's saying something there. These were the re smartest religious lawyers of the day. All right, so right away, immediately he goes into the synagogue. 
And how is Jesus' teaching is described? Power, authority. Now, what happens next is very interesting because he's preaching with authority, but now he's going to demonstrate authority. Just then, immediately, Euthos, a man with an unclean spirit, was in their synagogue. He cried out, What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit threw him into convulsions, shouted with a loud voice, and came out of him. They, all the people there, James, John, Simon, Andrew, the people in the synagogue, the scribes, Pharisees, they were amazed and so they began to ask each other what is this a new teaching with authority he commands authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him at once the news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity of galilee all right what's going on here we have an akatharos numa an unclean or impure spirit or a demon okay the jewish understanding of an unclean spirit is is interesting um, it relates to the presence of evil the presence of death so this person had evil and death not only was the spirit unclean but that man himself was unclean because of the spirit in him. He had death and evil upon him. Dominion is another word that is used to describe this, this, uh, this state of being demonized, having a demon indwell into somebody's spirit. So it starts off saying that the man had a unclean spirit or an unclean spirit singular but then it's later revealed that there are multiple spirits they are anticipating their doom because they know that jesus is what the hagios theos the holy one of god meaning that he is equal to god he has the authority of god he's been preaching with authority and guess what? Now he's going to demonstrate authority. Epitamal, he rebuked, which is a sharp disapproval, a harsh criticism because of the behavior or actions. In Old English, rebuke means to force back or repress. He orders with authority the demons to leave. And what do we get? Silence. That's the first thing we get. Be silent, shut up, quiet, and come out of him. So the unclean spirit orders silence and then leave. Or the, uh, Jesus orders the, the demons to be silent and then to leave. After a brief struggle, the demon does leave. And what's interesting here is the reaction of the people. It's the same in verse 27 as it is in verse 22. They were astonished and amazed at his authority. Jesus teaches about the kingdom of God and then he demonstrates what that kingdom of God looks like. The kingdom of God has authority in the spiritual realm. And verse 28, Jesus's fame then increases. Now we're going to move on because this demonstrating of the kingdom of God is going to continue. He's demonstrated in his teaching. He's demonstrated in his control over demons. Now he's going to demonstrate it in a different way from 29 to 34. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was laying in bed with a fever and they told him about her at once, immediately. So he went to her, by, took her by the hand, raised her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. When the evening came, after the sun had set, 
They brought him all those who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew who he was. All right. So let's set the scene here. We have Jesus, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, and Simon's mother-in-law, and presumably Simon's wife. Simon's going to become Peter. Shimon is going to become Petros at some point during the story. But right now he's Simon. So it's Simon's mother-in-law and probably his wife is there. I would imagine his wife is there. The situation, mother-in-law is sick with a fever. She would have been considered unclean to the Jewish folks because she was sick. She had, remember what we talked about in the, in the um, Walking in the Word series when we talked in Leviticus about clean and unclean. Clean and unclean doesn't mean that you have sinned, although you could sin and become unclean. What it means is that you have a reminder of death on you. So if you were bleeding from someplace, the Jewish idea of blood is life. You literally had life seeping out of you. Okay, so you were unclean if you were leaking life out of you, reminding people of death. If you had a rash that's viewed like decay, you would be unclean. Um, women during their menstrual cycle would be unclean because of the blood flowing out of them. Soldiers coming back from battle. All these folks haven't sinned, but they have a reminder of death upon them, making them unclean. So did Simon's mother-in-law sin? No, of course she didn't sin, but she would have been considered unclean. But what does Jesus do? Jesus goes in and holds her hand. This is huge. Sometimes we read things and we just walk right through them because we don't get the power of the image, but he holds her her hand. Why is that such a big deal? Because if someone was unclean, you would never touch them because the fear was that the uncleanliness would travel from them to you. You would then be unclean. Jesus doesn't do that. He holds her hand and the cleanliness, the life flows from her, from him into her. The action isn't the expected action. The expected action is death flows into Jesus, but no, life flows into the mother-in-law. He takes her by the hand and she is healed. Instead of uncleanliness, death, moving from the woman into Jesus, Jesus transfers healing and life into the woman. The healing is a paradigm shift for everybody involved. So Jesus has authority in his teaching. He has authority over the demonic spirits. And now he has authority over life itself. Verses 32 through 33, healing continues for the whole town. Everybody comes. He healed them. He delivered them. He continued this kingdom of God experience for all of these people. Notice again, the demons were ordered to be silent because they knew who he was. Why? Why did he make them silent? The reason why he made them silent is because they have no business giving anybody the gospel. The gospel is the good news that the kingdom of God is now here in this person, Jesus. And he is demonstrating his authority over teaching demons and life itself. And these demons have no business making that proclamation. They are fallen, defeated creatures, and Jesus is letting them know that. Now, this is where we're gonna finish for today. We still haven't gotten out of chapter one, but we're gonna finish chapter one next week. So until next week, this is the Wandering Wesleyan, Chaplain Greg. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Uh, put some comments below, share the video, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. But until then, God bless.